you will hear a number of different recordings, and you have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read instructions and questions. And you have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played only once. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a student and a railway clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Central Station, Norwich, Sue Brown speaking. Can I help you? Is that the railway station? Yes. Uh, is there a card that you can buy railway tickets and allows you to get discounts on it? You mean a rail card? Yes, there are various types. There's the young person's rail card and the senior citizen's rail card, for example. Well, I'd like a young person's rail card, but I'm over 21. Is that okay? Do I still qualify? Yes, you're eligible from 18 to 25. Great. And how much does it cost? 18 pounds. Okay. And can I get it over the phone? Well, I can take your details and process it now over the phone, but you'll need to come in to collect the card. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I just need to take down some details. First of all, can I have your name? Stephen Crockers. Okay, so first name Stephen. Is that Stephen with a V? No, with PH. Right. And can you give me your surname again? That's Crockers. Crocker with a C? No, I'll have to spell it out for you. K R O C K E R S. Right, thank you. Now, you said you were over 21. Can I ask for your exact date of birth, please? Yes, sure. It's the 3rd of February. Yes? And the year's 1979. 1979. Okay, lovely. So the next thing I need to know is your permanent address. Right. I'd better give you my parents' address then. I'm probably moving soon. Yes, that'll be fine. It's 158 Kingwood Close. Is Kingwood one word or two? One. Right. Norwich. And can you tell me the postcode, please? It's NR46JF. NR46JS. No, F for Freddy. Right. And the next thing I need is your telephone number. Do you mean my parents' number? Yes, the number at your permanent address. OK. It's Norwich 456321. And are you living at that address now? No, in term time I'm in lodgings. But like I said, I might be moving soon. Never mind. Just give me the address where you're staying now. Right. It's 62 Housewalk Terrace, Wakefield. And the postcode? WF14NN. Right, that's fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. And I want to get a ticket. Can I do that now and get the discount or do I have to wait until the card's ready? No, you can book the ticket now and collect it at the same time as you get the card. OK, so I want to return ticket to London next week. How much will that cost? Well, it depends on what sort of ticket you get. There are four different kinds. I'll go through them for you. Right. The cheapest one's the London Day Out. That's good if you're just going away for the day. It includes some bus and tube travel in London. But you have to travel outside peak hours. That costs £18. OK. Now, the next one's called the Super Advance Return. You can travel on any train with that, but you have to book your seat one day ahead. Actually, it's better to book earlier if you can, because there's only a limited number of tickets. OK, and how much is that? It's £23. No, that doesn't sound too bad. What about the other types of tickets? They're more expensive. 
There's one called the Saver, which, again, you can use on most trains outside peak hours. That's 29.30. But you don't need to buy it in advance. You can get it on the day you travel. Mm, that's a bit expensive. And finally, there's the Open Ticket. And with that, you can travel on any train on any day of the week, and you don't need to book ahead. But that costs £60. Pounds. £60? Pounds? Right. I'll have a super advance. Now, I'd like to leave next Friday morning on the 8.30 train and come back on Sunday at 10 p.m. And you said that usually costs £23? Pounds? That's right. So how much do I save with the rail card? You get a third off. A third off... Twenty-three pounds is seven pounds sixty-six, so you'll pay fifteen thirty-four. But then this time you have to pay for the rail card too. That's fifteen thirty-four plus eighteen pounds, so altogether you'll have to pay thirty-three pounds thirty-four. And when can I collect them? They'll be ready by Wednesday. They should be at the bookings office after about ten a.m. Oh, uh, I don't know if I can make it on Wednesday. You can't post them, can you? No, you have to collect your rail card in person and sign it. And I nearly forgot to tell you, you need a passport-sized photograph for it. If you don't have one, there's a machine on the station. No, I think I've got one somewhere. I needed some for my college application. I think I had one left over. Good. So, is there anything else? No, that's great. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a talk to new students at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Hi, it's good to see you all here today, and what a pity the weather is so bad for your first day at university. It could at least have stayed sunny today. Now, my name is Pat Baker. I work for Student Services, and I'm going to tell you about our mentoring scheme for new students. We've had it in place for a few years now, and people starting at university for the first time in general find it a very positive experience at these meetings. What happens is this. Each of you, if you want to join the scheme, will be assigned a mentor. That is, someone who's been studying here for a year or two, and who can show you the ropes. In other words, show you how things work. Give you advice if you need it, and just generally be friendly, contact for you in the university. Of course, you'll have your tutors and lecturers, who will also help you with academic problems. But this is someone more your own age, who has been through the same experience quite recently. What the mentor does is to have a group of usually two or three students, and he or she organizes meetings, preferably about once every two weeks. We generally find that more than that is just too often. Where you chat about your problems, university life, or just about things in general, and your mentor will give you the benefit of his or her experience. If you're joining this scheme, you'll be meeting your mentor today, just after lunch. If you haven't signed up, by the way, it's not too late. Come and see me after the talk. Don't be frightened about this first meeting. It's going to be quite short, so you won't have time to tell your mentor all your difficulties. You'll just get to know each other a little bit, and most importantly, fix a time and a place for your next meeting which you can have when you're feeling more relaxed and not so overwhelmed by the newness of it all. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 17.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 17. Mentors, as I've said, have been through the same experience as you quite recently, so they can understand your problems. They'll be able to tell you about academic systems, which are so different at university from what you were used to at school. Also, because at university you are much more independent and you have to spend so much time studying on your own, they can suggest techniques for studying which will help you to keep up to date with your work. This university is an enormous place, so another thing which they'll be able to help with is university facilities. You know, anything from sports halls to libraries to medical services, and they can probably help you get involved in all sorts of social activities too. Parties, clubs, sports, whatever. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. So, as you can see, this is a pretty useful scheme, but it does rely on people keeping in touch. The telephone's pretty useful if you have one, but students are busy people and often out doing things, so email is probably better. Your mentor will be able to show you how to get an email account. They don't cost anything to students, they're free. For people who have never been away from home before, a mentor is a useful contact and support, somewhere between a friend and a parent. And no doubt, as the year progresses, and you start getting nervous around exam time, your mentor will be ready with useful tips on the best way to pass your exams. After all, they did the same ones either last year or the year before, and they passed them. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hey, Simon. You look down. How are you getting on with your essay for Professor Jones? Not very well, I'm afraid. I can't seem to get my head around it. I mean, in such a wide topic that I really haven't got a clue where to start. Oh, poor you. I'm actually free now, so I can give you a hand if you like. You have until the end of this week, don't you? Yeah, I have to hand the essay in on Friday afternoon. But the professor wants to see my proposal on Wednesday morning. Today is Tuesday, so that's tomorrow. You had better get a move on. Let's have a look. Thanks. I'm just trying to brainstorm some ideas, but I haven't got very far. Let me see. Well, firstly, I think that writing your ideas in a list like that really isn't going to help. Remember how we were taught to do spidergrams at the beginning of the year? Diagrams? No, not diagrams. Spidergrams. It's supposed to mimic the way our brains process information rather than simply expecting them to come out in some kind of logical order. They're also sometimes called spider graphs because of how they look. Like a spider. <laughs> okay, I'll start over again. Right. Now, our essay is on people's motivation for participating in extreme sports. There are two sides to this, really. The external and internal influences. Right. So let's look at the external influences first of all. So what kind of things make people want to do extreme sports? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the amount of media attention on the topic. There are always stories about people taking part in the latest craze. Exactly. Now, let's think about this more carefully. Why does so much appear in the media? I don't know. 
I've never really thought about it. Well, according to the published materials out there, it's a reflection of modern culture. Of course. Yes, you're right. Now, what about the factors that come from within the person? I suppose the most obvious thing to say is the adrenaline rush. Right. But what else? People would want to test their limits, which is a psychological need that all humans have. And there's one more thing that we haven't added yet. What's that? What all animals do naturally. Compete, of course. Right. It's the element of competition that drives all things to be the best. Now, why didn't I think of that before? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Which background reading have you done on the topic? Actually, none at all. It's really bad, isn't it? But I just haven't had the time with my part-time job. I know what you mean. But honestly, it's so much easier once you've read around the topic a bit. Did you get a copy of the suggested sources? Because if not, I've got one here. No, I didn't. Thanks. That's a great help. I tell you what. You write down the main points, and I'll read it out. Okay, go for it. The first one's by a guy called Hans German, and it's called Crossing Borders. It's a research project that was carried out on around 200 participants of extreme sports. It's a really interesting read. Okay, what next? The next book was written by a man called Richard Bell and is called Motivation Theories. It gives an overview of thrill-seeking and why people choose to put their lives in danger. Is it long? Yeah, it's quite weighty. Why? It's just I really don't have very long before the essay needs to be in. So is there anything on there that would help me more quickly? Well, I did find a podcast on the topic. I didn't write down the author's name, but they are called The Mind Files. And it's also about the theories and principles, but obviously doesn't go into as much detail as in a book. That's absolutely fantastic, Therese. How can I ever repay you? Oh, I don't know. A coffee, maybe? Of course. My treat. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about writing for radio. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We're going to move on today to look at some of the key principles of writing for radio. Of course, the main thing that you have to remember is that a radio script is not written to be read, but to be spoken and heard. Now, putting this into practice is more difficult than it seems, because writing as we speak involves abandoning many of the normal rules of writing that have been taught to us from an early age. This is because we need to concentrate on how the piece sounds. Written words convey information, 
but they don't convey the full meaning of what you want to say. They don't tell you what to emphasize, what speed something should be read at, or where the pauses should come. So these have to be indicated in a script. Whatever is said on radio, whether it's a link to a magazine program, a film review, or even a voice piece in the news, needs to sound as if it's coming from the mind of the speaker, almost like part of a conversation, rather than something that's being read. Before you begin to write, it's a good idea to know who you're talking to, to visualize a typical member of the radio station's audience. If you're writing a film review for a local audience, for example, think about how you tell your grandmother about the film. Or if you're reviewing a pop concert, think about how you tell your friend about the band. The words have much more impact if each person feels they're being spoken to directly. So your tone needs to be informal, rather than using impersonal words like listeners or the audience. You can make it more informal. Include them in what you're saying by referring to us and we. Once you know who you're talking to, the next thing is to work out what you're going to say. Don't forget that the person listening to you has no opportunity to ask questions. And in the same way, you can't repeat what you've just said. For these reasons, it's important that your script is logical and progresses smoothly. Too many facts too close together will cause confusion. So space them out evenly. The best scripts allow listeners to visualize what you're describing. For example, instead of giving the physical dimensions of a field, describe it as being the size of, say, a football pitch. If you're talking about a tall building, relate it to perhaps a 10-story block of flats. Now, all scripts need something that will grab the attention of the listener. You need something that'll make them say, hey, I want to stop and listen to this. So the first sentence has to do this for you. It needs to be intriguing, interesting, and then it needs to be backed up by a second sentence that explains what you're talking about. The last sentence should also give your listeners food for thought and can be in the form of a question or a statement that sums up the item. After you've finished your script, you need to polish it up. And the most effective method of doing this is by reading it aloud. This also helps you to avoid tongue twisters or words that you might find awkward to pronounce. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.